What a wonderful, wonderful privilege to just enter into God's presence again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we come before you today. We honor you, we praise you, we worship you. And we thank you, Lord, that we can ask that you will really speak to our hearts today. And we honor you in Jesus' wonderful name. And we vow to give you and you alone the glory. Amen. The title for this day's message is God's Way. Now, I've said many, many times, many people, most people want to serve God, but in a, in a capacity of, we want to be advisors to God. We want to tell Him how we should do things, and what we want Him to do, and how we should do it. But there is only God's way. Uh, let us start immediately by reading a portion of Scripture first. If, if you go read the whole chapter, I'm only going to a certain point in, in this, but if you read the whole chapter, you will find that in 27 verses, you will read about the life, the sinful attitude, the repentance, and the coming to salvation of one man, and also the downfall of another. But let us read 2 Kings 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. But he was a leper. So here we have a, a wealthy man in favor with his king. He has status, but he also had leprosy. So around us today, there are many that, that, that carry serious challenges, infirmity, sickness, and, prob and problems. Yes, leprosy uh, under their designer clothes and behind smiling faces. Smiles that never really reach or touch their heart. God brought this Naaman, advice, this proud man, this, 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 this man that, that had all the position and the status, he gave him advice and he gave him a solution, not through the king's uh, advisors, but to a young girl that was brought there as a captive. Verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten chances of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have thee with sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Once again he relied on his status and his wealth. He took a vast amount of silver and gold, expensive clothing, everything with him. Funny how easily people will spend money on their health. They realize that they have a need, but still believe that they can buy uh, health. Yet the king draw up a letter directly to the king of Israel. Look at his attitude. It, it wasn't like, like he was saying, King, would you please put in a letter of recommendation uh, uh, to, for me uh, to the prophet? Explain to the prophet. No, no, no. He went above and over the prophet's head. So, so he didn't even count the prophet. The prophet was a tool that had to do what, what the king tells him to do. And, and it was literally like the prophet was forced to do something for him by using his own king against him. They knew that Syria was uh, the enemy and a strong one. And, and therefore they, they, they sent this letter. And when the king of Israel read this letter, look at the king's response. Verse 7, And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the, read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So the king trembles, and he actually shown, he has, uh, shows his, his unbelief as well. For if he really knew the prophet, in Israel, if you really know knew Elijah and what God did through this man, he wouldn't have been so troublesome. 
he would have at least just contact Elijah and says, Elijah, this is what I received. But there was no consultation. It was just renting of, uh, renting of clothes. And he, and, and he started complaining and moaning. He actually showed that he don't believe that God will do it for that man. He asked, am I God? Am I God to kill and make a life? He, at least he acknowledges that it is only in and through God that it can happen. But if he knew God and he knew Elijah, he wouldn't have acted that way. In verse 8, And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. So this is very interesting. The prophet isn't phased at all. The prophet had, has n uh, no doubt in his heart that God can do this. He says, man, just send him to me. But what happened when he did? If you look at this, here is a trembling king, but an unmovable prophet. He's not impressed with gold and silver, not even with Naaman uh, rocking up in, in uh, almost in a show of force in front of his house. Imagine the neighbors peeping through their curtains. I wonder who is visiting the prophet today. Just look at the entourage. Look at that coach. But what a shock to Naaman. I mean, just now the king of Israel trembled because of a mere letter from his king. Now the prophet doesn't even come out of his house to welcome him. Even worse, he sent a servant to speak to him. And the message that the servant, <laughs> the servant brought, what an audacity. Just listen to this. Verse 10. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Think on this. Just hear him complain. Am I a beggar? Am I some dirty beggar that I must go and wash myself? Does he think I'm dirty? He didn't even come out to greet me or examine me like a doctor would. At that moment, it was still his arrogance speaking. See, we are the same. We do not always like uh, God's methods or the people he uses. We want uh, someone important. We want a prophet so-and-so to speak to us. We want uh, this evangelist. This healing evangelist, he must pray over me. This man must touch me and lay hands on me. But not that sister in church or that brother. No, no, we, we've got the names, the important things, and people in our eyes, the king of Israel. Listen to him, ranting on and on and on. Verse 12. Are not a banner and far, far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them, <coughs> pardon me, and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? Just understand me this morning. Now Amon wasn't wrong regarding the river Jordan. We were in Israel in 2015, and we baptized people at Jardinet, the, the official or the main baptismal site for all travelers to Israel. And, the, and then later on, Pastor Bert Fiedner also baptized someone in the Jordan, at the Jordan crossing. The water there is muddy. But what, what, is, what is wrong here is the attitude that started it all of Naaman. He turned away in a rage, like someone would, who would spin the tires on his car as a sign of disgust or their contempt, so that everyone in the street can see that he doesn't approve of the situation. Guess what God did? He used a captive girl to send him to Israel, and once again he uses the servants to challenge him. His own servants come to him, and it, literally, and I am paraphrasing now, they're literally saying to him, Sir, you are willing to pay millions, because that was the, um, uh, the, the value of what he brought. You are willing to pay millions for your healing. This man 
is asking you for nothing. Also, it does not ask you to, to do some uh, impossible or difficult task. Look, we've come this far. Just give it a go. What can you lose? What can you lose? Your attitude. Verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan. According to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Look at this. Take a blessing of thy servant. Now he's a servant. Now he's not this the most important man from Syria anymore. In the first place, when, when he stopped there, it was almost like this uh, uh, gangster movies that you see where, the, where the, 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 the mafia boss sits in his limo and, and all he do is to, to just roll down the window a little bit and just, just bark his orders through there. But now he gets out of his coach and he faces the prophet. It must have been a test of faith too for him. After you go in the first time and wash you, nothing. The leprosy is still there. Second time, the leprosy is still there. Until the very last time. How many times have we not missed our blessing? Until the very last time. How many times have we not missed it? Through pride and through arrogance. How many times have we not turned away at the sixth attempt? I don't see anything. Turned away at the brink of a miracle. All of a sudden, he now don't send someone to speak to the, he don't send a letter, he don't send a servant, but he go himself and now he can face the, the prophet. The gift he brought, this change from payment for a service rendered to an offering of thing, thanks, even though the prophet did not accept it. All of a sudden he realizes how little of this stuff are really worth. That it cannot buy your health or your happiness. Maybe you've been waiting so long for your miracle. Maybe you must check your heart, your attitude. Maybe you are going into the muddy waters for the sixth time today. Don't give up. Don't give up. Will you walk away clean today? Do you want status and riches or your healing? Check your attitude and if it is right, check the time. Is it God's time? If you go read 20, verse 26, you will see Elijah confronting Gehazi and he asks him, is it now the time to receive all these things? Is it really now the time to, 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 to exchange your faith and everything we stood for and everything you've seen uh, being with me? Is this now the time to change all that and exchange it to accept stuff from the world, riches and, and, and the clothing and all of that? Just a word of, of warning to everyone ministering to others. While I'm preparing this message, this just fell into my spirit. What would happen if all the stuff that we prayed of people, sickness, infirmity, diseases, poverty, came on us because we took the glory and the rewards for ourselves? Think on that. As leaders, we need to be humble before God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this very moment I ask that you will be with us. That you will just help us to check our hearts in the mirror of your word and in the wisdom and discernment of your spirit. That we will ask ourselves, am I busy acting like a spoiled brat in arrogance, standing before God, demanding my healing, demanding that He comes through for me. Am I the one to blame for my own misery, my attitude, and my way of doing things, and arrogance may be standing between me and my miracle? Father, recently Dr. Jonathan David made this remark and when he said, when your praise is bigger, goes higher than your problem, a miracle is on the way. Father, help us to check our hearts, to check our attitude, 
And then also to say, Lord, help me to be ready to receive in your time. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you have done. And Father, with this message this morning, I pray for everyone that may be battling some disease or infirmity in this time. I pray for those that are, have been diagnosed and well, with COVID as positive. I pray for them. I pray, oh God, because you are bigger than all of these things put together. You know the end from the beginning, so you already knew about all the sicknesses and all the diseases and all the pandemics and all the dirty and filthy stuff that the world wants to put on us. Because, uh, Father, you have called this in the, in, 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 right in the beginning of the word, you've said the diseases, the curse of Egypt. Father, this is still the curse of Egypt, all these things. And we come before you now, and I pray for everyone. I ask, oh God, that they will just check their attitude and say, Lord, I'm in your hand. I believe you can. I'm not going to rent my clothes like the king and says, sure, am I now God? No, no. Thank you that we know that we are with God. And thank you that we know God and that we know you can. You will and you want to. I honor you and I praise you as I speak healing and say to people this morning, not because of me, but because of the word, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that you uh, just interfere and, and intervene and, and come into their, uh, walk into their hearts and in their homes today. And you know about every challenge. Help them, Father, is my prayer. Help our broken world. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for our own country. And we ask of God that you will just intervene in Jesus' name. And that we as your people may glorify you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you. Don't give up. You are on the brink of a miracle. Check your heart. Amen. Don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in. God is still. On the throne, don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in. Remember, you're not alone. When Satan have you look at the trials of life that surround you, he tries to appear. And brings doubt and fear all around you. Don't look with the eye or listen with your ear. Just cry out to God. He's always near in your darkest dark. Your miracle is here. Don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in, God is still on the throne. Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in, remember you're not alone. The devil is a thief, he sends all his troubles to confound you. He lies and he says, this time there is no way you can make it through. God's word is true, the battle is the Lord's. Don't give in to fear, think of things that's pure and praise the Lord. Your miracle is here. Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in, God is still on the throne. Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in, remember you're not alone. Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in, God is 
is still on the throne. Don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give in, remember you're not alone. Don't give in, remember you're not alone. 